Anyways, I am uh, going to dive into this message. My, uh, my mission today, my title today, if you will, is titled A Sound Community. Somebody say A Sound Community. A sound Community. Turn with me to John chapter 11. We're going to read verses 38 through 45. And it reads like this. It's on the screen. You can follow it on in your app, Bible app. Uh, you can follow along in the Prevail app. You can also pull the Bible up in there. It says this, then Jesus, uh, I want to say this just real quick. In the Prevail app, you can follow along in the Bible. You can also make notes in the Prevail app, and it'll save it for you, just so you know. Okay? Cool. So fancy. Then Jesus, again groaning in himself, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Somebody say, take away the stone. Who said that? Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord... By this time, there is a stench. Somebody say, he stank. For he has been there, been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. And I know that you always hear me, but because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe you sent me. Now when he said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus. Somebody say Lazarus. Lazarus. Say it with me. Say Lazarus. 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 Come Forth. Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died came out, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, Loose him and let him go. <laughs> then, somebody say, then. Somebody say, then. Many of the Jews who had come to Mary and had seen the things Jesus did believed in him. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for what you're going to say to us this morning. I pray that you speak through me in Jesus' name. Amen. I am going to do my best to make a short message. How about that? Y'all like, good luck. This passage, known as the seventh sign in John's gospel, contains this famous story of the resurrection of Lazarus. There are not a lot of details, um, or there are a few details in scripture about the relationship between Jesus and the three siblings, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. We know that he loved them. Um, in the scripture, if you read up above, it talks about where it says that Jesus the one that Jesus loved, and it actually lists out Jesus loved Martha, Jesus loved Mary, Jesus loved Lazarus, right? Um, which signifies that Jesus had a very unique relationship with each one of them. Unique enough that the scripture, that the writer would notate his love for all three of them. Amen. Uh, it goes to show that Jesus is uh, an amazing God who cares for us individually. Amen. And some of us need to hear these words that Jesus loves you. Amen. Jesus loves Aaron. Jesus loves Mackenzie. Jesus loves Roger, Sharon, Clint. Come on, come on, come on. Jesus loves you. Amen. Are you hearing me? Some of us need to hear those words and maybe say those words to ourselves 
uh, in the morning because it's easy to go throughout the world and throughout life and, and, re- and forget that we're loved by our Heavenly Father. When stuff is thrown at you, darts are thrown at you, and people coming for you, right? And everybody's got an opinion, and everybody's got something to say, and everybody thinks they can tell you how to live your life, and everybody is sure that if you try this, you'll be successful, and if you try this, you'll be stress-free. And you, you get what I'm saying? And the world promises you over and over the way to a better life is no stress and all these things, and then you realize it's just not possible you need to realize and rest in the reality that we're loved by Jesus. Amen. I, listen, I, I don't. I, before I go anywhere else, I need you to. I need you to get this revelation. You are loved by the Lord. Well, Fred, how much does He love me? Well, let's see. He gave His only Son. Somebody say only Son. I love you, but Mr. Maxwell ain't going nowhere for nobody. Amen. Amen. If it comes down between you and my son, I sounded like uh, uh, Denzel Washington when I said that. You and my son, I didn't sound like him that time. If it comes down between you and my son, I'm going to choose my son. If you think about it, Jesus, I mean, God did the same thing. If it came down between us and his son, he chose his son, but not for the reasons that we might choose our son. He chose his son for us. So essentially, he loves you enough to choose you. Amen. I mean, we got to, let's, let's, just, let's just live in this moment for a moment. Uh, uh, God doesn't need anybody to complete him. He doesn't need anything else. He wasn't lacking anything. His life wasn't empty. He was fully capable of doing anything and being okay by himself. He wasn't sitting in heaven lonely going, let's make man. That was not his reason. He loved us enough to give his son for us. Amen. Think about that for a moment. You didn't have to. You only shut that one up. Y'all like how high pitch I get. <laughs> My granddaddy used to do that. He'd be like, hey, granddaddy. <laughs> Anyways, so this whole thing transpires. If you go back and read a few scriptures, and some of you know the scripture, uh, Lazarus falls ill. He's sick. And the sisters send word to Jesus that the one you love uh, is ill. He's sick. They sent word, said, the one you love, he's, he's sick. He's falling sick. And they sent this word hoping that Jesus would come um, quickly before he passes away. Amen? And uh, I don't know about y'all, but you ever, you ever, <laughs> you ever did a, uh, one of those like precursor prayers where you know something's about to come? You're like, Lord, mm, yes, thank you, Jesus. I'm looking at the bank account now, and I know in two weeks, ah, I'm going to need you to move, Father. (laughs) You ain't ever done it. You ought to try that every now and then when you pray, just shake just a little. mm, Feels good. So Mary, them, they see him falling ill, and they know that this illness is probably going to lead to death. But their hope is that Jesus, as you know, he's been doing all these miracles for everybody else. He loves us, so... I, we're going to send word to him, and, and our hope is that the love is strong enough that he'll stop his trip, come on over here, and he'll, Lazarus, and then go back to where he's got to go. Amen. So they send word to him, and Jesus, you know, does something that 
none of us thinks it makes any sense. He says, this sickness is not unto death. Right? But we'll be there. Then he waits two whole days. <laughs> waits. Actually waited a day and then some believe that it took them two days to journey there. So waited a day and then they started walking towards. He tells the disciples we got to go. Uh, you know, and they, you know, they say where well, Lazarus is dead and uh, so many things go down in the scripture. Just go back and read it. It's, it's really intriguing. It's crazy to read how it happens. And so Jesus is having a, a discussion with his disciples. He tells them he's only sleeping. And they're like, oh, what are you talking about? He says, he's only sleeping. And then, and then he finally goes, Lazarus is dead, guys. Pay attention. You know what's crazy about this, too? Let's, let's think about this. Because Jesus is talking to his disciples. He's telling him th that Lazarus is sleeping. Amen. I, I, I picked this up when I was reading this. But think about this. Multiple times Jesus had raised people from the dead. He always used the same language. He would always tell them they're only sleeping. He's only sleeping. She's only sleeping. He's just asleep. And the disciples didn't recognize the language that Jesus was using. He was trying to teach them a principle. I don't ever acknowledge death as death. I acknowledge it as sleep. Come on, somebody. Many of us were dead in our sins. The Bible says we were dead in our sins. Come on. But when it goes on to talk about it, it talks about you become alive. You are awakened to the things of God. Guess what? We're out of God's will. We're asleep. And then he wakes us up. Amen? So Lazarus falls ill. The sisters send word to Jesus, hoping he will return immediately and heal their brother before he dies. And Jesus replies, his reply seems encouraging. But he has a plan in mind that's not so simple. He arrives... Four days, listen to this, four days after Lazarus is buried. <laughs> Wait one minute, Jesus. This is Lazarus. This is the one you love. This is your friend. This is your guy. Y'all laugh and have a good old time. You know what I'm talking about? Wait a minute. Four days after he's dead, you show up? Somebody say four days. four days. Jesus had a purpose for this incident. He even hinted at his purpose in his prior arguments with his religious critics. Come on, somebody. So when he shows up, Martha comes to him and She's like, if you had been here, he wouldn't be dead. Anybody ever had a real conversation with God like that? If you hadn't, if you had just showed up, I wouldn't have had this problem. Amen? It's real quiet in the house of the Lord today. That's okay. Uh, if, if you had just done what I thought you said you would do, this wouldn't be going down. Anybody ever prayed a real prayer to God? You told me to do this. I'm doing this. And you don't seem to be anywhere to be found. You said you loved me. And now my brother's dead. And she's being honest. She's being real. Like, she's being wrong. And, and we got to learn how to express that faith is not uh, uh, disregarding your true pain and emotions. See, the church will teach you that you have to set aside all these things. And faith is not feeling and all this stuff. No, it's not. It's not feeling. But it doesn't disregard how you feel. 
Amen, church. Because we get so caught up in how we uh, uh, we got to make sure that we don't disrupt God doing whatever he's going to do in our life by having some hard feelings toward God if we you, you get what I'm saying? And that's what we, some of, a lot of us was raised in. We were raised in a church that taught us, don't you express any kind of feeling towards the Lord, and it's abuse. We don't even believe that's, we, we believe that's abusive in a natural relationship. If somebody, if my kid came to me and tried to express their feelings, I was like, please don't tell me your feelings. I don't need to hear your feelings. It ain't about your feelings. People will look at me like, you should go to jail. Amen. We got to get that kid out of your house. He doesn't need to be there. That's abusive. He shouldn't be there. That is not healthy. And we wonder why our churches are declining and why people are walking out the doors because we created unhealthy uh, 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 environments in which people can't even express how they feel anymore. We don't need to talk about feelings. Faith is not emotional. Faith is emotional. Faith is not just emotional. It's emotional and it's truth. So faith, while it may disregard some of our emotion, it doesn't disregard all of our emotion. It just points our emotions to the truth that's found in the word. Oh, y'all, okay, okay, okay. So Martha comes and she's expressing some emotions, but her faith guides her to a truth. Come on, somebody, listen to me. She says, you could have been here. If you had been here, my brother wouldn't die. Nevertheless, come on. I don't even think she used that word. But she basically said, I know he will rise again. Somebody say, I know he'll rise again. So Martha expresses faith when she meets Jesus and trusts in God and Christ. Mary, on the other hand, Mary is Mary. Mary's a little bit more emotional. Come on, somebody. Mary reminds me of my mama. I love it because we get to see kind of what some of what Mary said, but I wish the Bible, I wish we had video and you could see Mary. I bet her neck was popping. Mm. How in the world, Jesus, son of God, you out here healing all these people. We out here funding you, and you don't even show up to heal your boy? Mary is much more emotional and, and impulsive, and when she hears that Jesus rise, she quickly makes an exit. She makes an, an exit. And when she makes this exit, it inspires the the curiosity in the mourners who follow her and form a crowd. So so she's she's hyped. My brother wouldn't be dead if you would have been here. You know? Crump. Mm, 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 mm. He dead. Dead, bro. Four days? Four days? Mary's, she's upset. So upset that she begins to weep. Bible says she was weeping. Weeping, this term used in the Bible because there's two different forms of weeping in the Bible. There's weeping and then there's wept. So we see that Mary and Martha are weeping and then the Bible says Jesus wept so they're weeping and they're mourning they're, ah, it's like a liking unto a loud ah, just cry you ever had one of them cry so you just ah, you, to the point where you almost throw up you ain't never cry like that they're weeping and Jesus sees them weeping and he's moved by compassion and he starts to weep But the Bible 
portrays Jesus' weeping as a solitude where he's just standing by himself. I thought about that for a minute. I thought about the reality of this moment and picturing Jesus while everybody's kind of just going in and he's just softly got tears running down his face. And I thought about it because I, you know, I thought about how my reactions are. There, there are times, depending on what happens and what's going on, where I would just, I remember when, when Bishop Tony passed away and I got the call, as soon as I hung up the phone, I was, I was, I was done. I was, I mean, it was the weeping, weeping. But I found myself in moments, even from that day till now, I'll just be sitting there thinking about them, tears coming to mind. Right? Like, you ever lost a loved one and you start thinking about them and you just, you just tear up? And it's not a hard cry, but it, it comes deep from your soul. Deep from a longing and a care and a love for a person that just causes you to weep. Jesus sees them weeping and he literally is moved to compassion and he quietly weeps with them. The raising of Lazarus is more theatrical than some of Jesus' other, other miracles. Uh, and and so with Jesus, with Lazarus, he waits to death is undeniable, right, to perform this miracle. And all these people witness what's happening, and they're moved to believe in him. Now, all this is great, but I titled this message, A Sound Community. Somebody say, A Sound Community. Are y'all ready to get into this? A Sound Community. And I got, I believe this passage is important in the ending of the series because Jim, Jesus, I believe, d demonstrated a few principles for us as believers, as a church, that I think is going to be highly important as we believe it, are, are preparing for what's next for Prevail. There's a lot of things happening. There's a lot of next happening. Amen? And so it's important for us to recognize these moments, right? So I wanted to first start off with this and say there is no shame or sin in weeping or weeping with others. There's no shame or sin in weeping or weeping with others. The shortest scripture in the Bible displays one of the most powerful principles of all time. The shortest scripture in the Bible is Jesus wept. Somebody say Jesus wept. As I was thinking about this, I just began to ask the Lord, God, help me really encompass this principle in a way that makes sense, that's powerful. Give me some words for it. And the Lord said this to me. Listen to this. You might want to write this out. He said, power without humanity is abuse. Power devoid of humanity is abuse. How does Jesus model this principle? Jesus, in this moment, listen, Jesus is all God, can do anything he want, don't have to answer a question, you know, don't have to reason with anybody. He could have healed them right in and there. He could have told them, stop crying, what y'all crying for? You already know what I can do. Why y'all acting like this? Blah, blah, blah. Jesus, who is all God, 
in this moment, in his ability as God, does not remove his compassion as the compassion of his humanity. He had a purpose for this moment. He knew exactly what he was going to do. He knew exactly how it would end. But he did not remove compassion for the people who were going through the thing that he had purposed. And the Lord said to me, Fred, power devoid of humanity, power without humanity is abuse. And how does this apply to us? For us, our status, our power in the world isn't a license to disregard compassion. Just because you got it all together don't mean you can be rough on people who don't have it all together. Amen. 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 Just because you're not weeping don't mean you got to tell everybody else to shut up weeping. Oh, it's about to get real tight in the house of the Lord. Here's the other principle that we can get from this. Uh, uh, Delivering an answer void of compassion goes against the model of Jesus. Hear me. Jesus could have gave them the answer and saved them from crying. He didn't have to cry. He knew what was going to happen. There was no reason for him to cry. To him, Lazarus wasn't gone. He was still alive. What what are y'all crying? He actually said he's only sleeping. Think about this. In Jesus' mind, Lazarus ain't dead. He's just asleep. None of us get sad about somebody sleeping. Come on, somebody. Yeah. Unless you want to go to the store and your, your mom and dad are sleeping. You're like. But none of us get sad about somebody sleeping. We do get sad and angry and upset and depressed about someone that we lose. Life, uh, a loved one that's dying or has died. Come on, somebody. In Jesus' mind, Lazarus ain't gone. But Jesus does not look at them and says, guys, I told y'all he was sleeping. Why y'all crying? Cut all that out. Go on somewhere. Get on out of here. Stop the crying. You just told me you had faith in me. Why are you acting like this? Why are you acting like you didn't just say what you just said? Don't you know who I am? Have you not seen my ministry? Have you not seen how many people I done healed? Have you not seen how many people I done raised from the dead? Have you not seen? Do you not? Do you? Are you guys not listening to me when I tell you I'm the son of God? I can do all things. There's nothing impossible for me. Have you? No, he doesn't say that. You know what he does? He stands and weeps with them. Because he knew, listen to this, he knew his abilities as God was not going to be what drew the people. It was his compassion for humanity. Mm. Yeah, you, ooh. And we want power over compassion. We want power. Give me that power, Jesus. And God says this to us, prevail. If you seek power as your end, that is what will be your end. Power without humanity is abuse. how saved you is if you don't learn how to love people where they are it's abusive and much of our entire church structure in America has been built on a very abusive system it's power structures power structures it's politics come on somebody let me get in with the pastor and say what I need to say so I can get there and then, and then I'm good. Yeah. Or let me, you know, depending on the church, let me get in with the elder team so I can get the pastor out because I don't really like him. Yeah. Yeah. Power. 
and power without humanity is abuse. We talked about this before. I can have a 1,000 horsepower car. If I drive that 1,000 horsepower car full throttle every single time I get into it, I'm going to cause massive carnage, crashes, people are going to get hurt every time. And a lot of what we've done in the church is drove a 1,000 horsepower car at full throttle. And we've been running over people. We've been tearing them down. And then we go, just pick yourself up. You're going to be all right. Or we go, why won't you come to church? This is where you need to be. Who wants to come? Who, who wants the definition of insanity is submitting yourself over and over to the same abuse? And I, I'm sorry, but most people just don't want to be insane Christians. Amen. Y'all either gonna love me today, y'all gonna like, oh, that's the pastor Fred I know right now. Hey, hey, that's my guy. Or you're gonna hate me. It's all right. There's no shame or sin in weeping or weeping with others. Listen, I don't care what your unsaved friend is, you can weep with them. You know, uh, people uh, I, I worked with this guy one time and he was in same sex marriage and, and you know it was a big old thing for the church and all this stuff and his, his uh, grandmother had passed and I just, I, I just loved him whatever you need man I had people oh, oh how you going shut up and take several seats. You ain't Jesus. Come on. And I've had people come at me lots about stuff. We'll just leave it at that. I don't feel no shame. I feel no shame and no sin in following Jesus and loving people unconditionally. Amen. And Prevail Church will be the church that feels no shame in following Jesus, loving people unconditionally, doing exactly what God tells us to do. A to the man. Come on, somebody. Amen. I want to say this to you. The next thing is this. Know the word, but trust in Jesus. Amen. Say, everybody say, know the word. Amen. Know the scripture. Know your Bible. Read it, but trust in Jesus. Let me say it again, because I know somebody going to get mad at me about this. Oh, here we go, here we go. Mary and Martha both knew the word. I mean, the Pharisees did a great job at helping people understand that at the end that the dead will be raised. Come on, somebody. Yep. So they knew, according to customs and preaching and all that stuff that Lazarus would be res resurrected in the end after some time. Are you hearing me? So they knew the word. They knew scripture. They were well versed in the Torah. They knew it. But I want to, I want to drop this on you. It is possible to know the word and miss a miracle if we refuse to trust Jesus. Because imagine for a moment if Jesus said, do you trust me? And they'd be like, oh, yeah, I mean, oh, he's going to raise. And, and Jesus would be like, you shall see this today. Well, uh, no, Jesus, he's going to raise at the end. No, this, this. I just told you he was going to come in a few minutes. He's like, you, you better get ready. He's about to walk around the corner. No, Jesus, uh, they would have missed a miracle had they relied on the word and not trusted the word. 
And a lot of us Christians, now y'all better get ready, strap in, because I'm going to say something. A lot of us Christians have put more trust in a book than the man, the Savior, Jesus Christ. We put more trust in the book that we call the Word than the Word. Oh, let me say it again. We put more trust in a book that we call the Word than the Word which the book tells us to trust in. Are you hearing me? So it's possible to know the Word, the book, and not trust Jesus and miss a miracle. Here's my question. What will you do when you can't find the word scripture to really express how you're feeling? What you going to do then? Oh, no, Fred, everything is in scripture. Everything uh-huh, everything's in scripture. Everything. Everything. Every feeling you've ever had in your entire life, you can express, you can find a scripture to express to the Lord. This is how I'm feeling. The devil's a liar. So what will you do when you can't find scripture to express how you're feeling? You got to learn how to trust the Lord. The Lord. Come on, somebody. Somebody say trust the Lord. Know the word. Come on. Now, listen, listen. I'm not saying disregard the book and, and throw it all to, to a side. Listen, I have a Bible right now that I would particularly not like to have in my house because I just got too many Bibles, okay? But there's nothing in me that will let me throw this thing away. I feel like if I throw it away, it's over with. House is going to burn down. Cars is going to catch on fire in the middle of the street every day. <laughs> and it really won't happen. But that's just the way my mind works. So I'm like, oh, I got to give this Bible to somebody. I got to take it somewhere and give it to somebody. You get what I'm saying? And it's not just because I, I don't need another Bible. I got like 8,000 Bibles, okay? It's a lot. And this Bible wasn't even my Bible. It was like a Bible I found some random place in a long time ago. And I just never gave it back. I was, I was that kind of youth steal Bibles. <laughs> you ain't never stole a Bible. You, some of y'all done stolen Bibles from the hotels. You know you have. Them Gideon Bibles. So you got to trust the Word. Like, and like, like, know the Word of God, but put your trust in Jesus. God is still speaking, people. God is still doing miracles. He's still, he's still performing uh, miracles. He's still doing the miraculous. He's still healing bodies. He's still changing lives. Come on, somebody. He's still making ways out of no ways. Jesus is still alive. He is still well. He is still moving in your life. If you need a healing, you will get a healing. That is the God I know. He's still moving. And you got to put your trust in Jesus. You know what Jesus says to her? She says, yeah, it'll be resur- you know, day of resurrection, blah, blah, blah. Jesus looks at her. He says, I am resurrection and life. Come on, listen, you got to catch this right here in this moment. Jesus didn't say, I got to pray for resurrection. I got to ask my father to send resurrection. I got to pray for life. I got to ask the Lord to send life. He said, I am resurrection and life. Listen, put your trust in Jesus. Why? Because he is everything that we need. He says in his word, in the word of God, it says to Jesus, says, I am the way, the truth and the life. Nobody can get to the heaven except through me. Come on somebody listen you got to understand it ain't the scriptures it ain't the book it ain't the Bible it ain't the church you go to it ain't the, the people you hang around it ain't none of that it is Jesus and Jesus only. You got to put your trust in Jesus. Well Pastor Fred I do I do I promise you I put my trust in Jesus that's why I read the Bible so much Amen that's good for you but don't be judgmental to people who don't read the Bible as much as you and still trust Jesus. Because some of us, we read our Bible so much that we think we're better than everybody else based on how much we read. I told you I was going to get tired of him then. Didn't I say it? I, didn't I say it? I told you. Didn't I forewarn you? 
Somebody say a sound community. A sound community trusts the Lord. Y'all don't have any clue. I have walked through people saying some of the most viscerous stuff to me based on some of the most random things. I could tell you stories that you'd be like, what? What? But I thank God that he's given me, given me the heart and the patience to love people. Even people that don't particularly deserve it. Pastor long enough, you realize there are a lot of people that don't deserve it. You think they don't deserve it. Amen. I'm not going to say they don't deserve it. There's a lot of people I feel in my spirit. See, this is where the, the truth directs your emotions. Come on. You see how that works? I feel like this, but Jesus says, now, nah, no matter how you feel, here's the truth. Man, I just taught a principle right there. Remember, death is not the end. Somebody say death Death. is not the end. We just sung it. We just sung this word. We just sung it in our song. Death is not the end. You are, you are. And we'll sing it, but we won't believe it. Things don't work out. I don't know if it's going to work out. Death is not the end. Listen, there was a superstition that the dead hung around for three days. After they were buried, they would hang around for three days, and then four days meant that they were truly gone, and there was no way for them to be brought back to life. And Jesus shows up on the fourth day to prove to them that with me, there is no limits. Somebody say no limits. With Jesus, there is no limits. With Jesus, all things are possible. With Jesus, whatever the situation is, there is always a possibility of freedom. Listen, they had no frame point. They had superstition. They had what they had at that moment. But Jesus came in and said, I'm going to show you something you ain't never seen before. Oh, y'all got to hear me because we read the scripture as we know it all. And Jesus said, I'm going to blow your mind. Let me show up on the fourth day when you have said it's over. So I can reveal to you that with me, death is never the end. Somebody say death ain't the end. It's not the end. He is not limited by our limitations. He is not chained to our superstitions. He is not chained to our labels. He is not chained to our limitations of what we think God can do. I had this, I, I think I've told this story before, but I had this guy, this, this one time I was sitting, I was working at this church and they walked in my office and they said, are you uh, Calvinist or Armenian? And, and, and I responded, uh, I, I just follow Jesus. I'd rather not put a, la- a label on it because the moment I label it, I limit it. Yeah. Can I s- listen to me? Look at me, y'all. The moment you label a move of God in your life is the moment you limit that move of God in your life. And people struggle with this. Listen, can I, can, can I give you a prime example? Yeah. Denominations, listen to me. Well, we're Pentecostal. We believe you can speak in tongues and do all these things and raise it there and do all these things. And we're Baptists. We believe that it's already done. Ain't nothing else you can do. And Jesus is like, what about me, God? What if you in your Baptist men, mindset, I want to use you to raise a person from the dead? Come on. And what if you over here with your uh, loud Pentecostal, what if I don't want to raise God, anybody from the dead? 
What if I get more purpose by, by them gone? You're going to be heartbroken over here because you put a limit on how God can move. Wow. You're going to be heartbroken over here because you put a limit on what God can do. And the moment we label it, we limit it. There are some things that need limits. I mean, need labels. Come on, somebody. I can't call this hammer. If I label this hammer and I try to hammer a nail with it, I'm going to get nothing done. Amen. If I call that microphone hammer and I try to hammer a nail with it, it might move, but I'm going to damage the microphone. So this is where labels are good. Amen. For some of us, we want to label everything. I just didn't feel like, I mean, I was in there trying to really feel what was going on in the atmosphere, and I couldn't get a word for it. Maybe because God didn't want to give you a word. Yeah. And I'll say this, he doesn't owe you a word. Oh, man, I've I got to move on. I'm just feeling real. I'm mad at the devil. This week right here, listen, let me tell y'all something. The devil tried. He tried. He tried. He had to catch these, this two-piece in prayer, amen? Two-piece. Mm. He caught these haymakers in the Holy Spirit, amen? Hallelujah. Y'all don't know about that. He tried. I want to say this. Jesus restores life, but healing is found in community. Somebody say, Jesus restores life, but healing is found in community. I hope I'm, I'm not going to spend too much time here, but I'm going I'm to say some stuff, okay? A common theme for Jesus throughout the Gospels is an invitation to us and to other people. A common theme throughout the gospel is an invitation to the people there to get involved in the work of the kingdom. He's constantly inviting them to participate in the miracle. He's constantly inviting them to participate in the healing. He's constantly inviting them to participate in whatever's happening in that moment. It's a common thing. He's always saying, come. Somebody say come. Yeah. He's constantly inviting them. We don't prove ourselves to him by our works, but we do show our response to his invitation by our works. He's constantly inviting us to participate in the move that he's doing. Are you hearing me? So healing the community looks like this. Removing barriers. Somebody say removing barriers. Community removes barriers. So in the scripture, Jesus is talking and he's you know, after he has this conversation, he says these words. Take the stone away. He said it to them. Take the stone away. Now, I want you to understand something. Jesus could have Jedi mastered the stone if he really wanted to. I mean, he was already raising a man from the dead. What is moving a stone with his hand going to do to the people there? But Jesus knows it's important not to take away the responsibility of the community to do the healing. Okay. Are you hearing me? So... He tells them, take away 
the stone. I want to, and listen, so healing in community looks like removing barriers, right? I love this. But before Jesus called him out, listen to this. Before Jesus even calls Lazarus out, he tells them to remove the stone. Before Lazarus experiences new life, the community is already at work removing barriers. Ah, the church should be at work removing barriers to the gospel before anybody, for anybody even hears the life of God calling them. Before they even move, before he even calls out to his life, before he even restores life, he puts them to work to remove the barrier. I got a question for us today. What are we doing to remove barriers in those who are far from Jesus? We're praying that God sends us the unsaved, but what are we doing before the unsaved shows up? How are we removing barriers before the unsaved shows up? I can pray all day long for the unsaved to get saved, but what am I going to do when God says, have you removed the barrier? I can pray all day long for the unsaved to get saved, but what's going to happen when they show up and I got a door closed on them? What's going to happen when they show up and they don't quite fit in and they learn it very quickly when they show up to my space and they know, oh, no, well, this is, they don't really like my people here. Before he even calls out, before they even know that this man is going to be raised from the dead, before Jesus calls out for new life to come into Lazarus, he calls the people to remove the stone. I got news for us, church. God put us here on earth to remove the stones. He put us here to remove the barrier. Listen to this. Removing the barrier was a sign of their faith that God was about to do the miraculous. It was a show for them that they believed that Jesus said, Jesus is who he was, and Jesus is who he says he will be. Come on, somebody. And listen, if they had not believed that Jesus was going to do something that they had never seen before, they wouldn't have removed the stone. But they believed, and their faith led them to do one thing, respond in faith to what he said. Listen, oh, oh okay, uh, how do we... Do we see this somewhere else? Yeah. Uh, listen, they need more wine, Jesus. It's not my time. Y'all just listen to do what he says to do. Move on. I love you. I love us as a church. I want to I wanna challenge us. God will bring the life. We got to remove the stone. We can't remove stones if we refuse to get our hands dirty. But Pastor Fred, why you be doing Bible study over at the cigar shop? Because I'm removing a stone. Well, you shouldn't do that. You know, people struggle. I don't ask people to come to my Bible study who struggle. I'm trying to meet those who are there. I'm not trying to get the church more churched in a different place. Amen. 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 I'm not going to do a Bible study at a strip club because that's not my thing. Amen. I'm not going to go start a stripper saving the stripper ministry because I, I don't need to do that. I know my struggle. Amen. And God won't call me to do that because he knows my struggle. Will I support somebody else who do it? Yes. Amen. Amen. Am I going to question their motives? No. That's what God called them to do. Amen. Amen. But I can go sit at the cigar shop and have a cigar with a bunch of people and talk about Jesus. And I don't feel any struggle because I don't feel 
that addiction and all that stuff. Amen. Amen. But I'm also not going to put pressure on people who feel that to come to my Bible study. Oh, y'all see how this works? That's called being a good person. Actually, that's called being a follower of Christ. I sound real condescending to help me, Jesus. I'm, I'm just... Removing the barrier was a sign of the faith that God was going to do the miraculous. If we believe God will do what he said he would do, if we believe that God will actually change the world, if we believe that God wants to grow and prevail and that people are going to come to this church far from Christ and going to experience things they never experienced before, if we believe that, guess what? We respond in faith by removing barriers. Somebody say barriers. Somebody say barriers. Here's the other thing. Community removes binds. It said that Lazarus, so Jesus calls Lazarus out, and he comes out, and he is bound hand and foot, and he has a cloth over his eyes. The word binds means chains, ties, knots, winds. You hear me? And the Lord, I begin to ask the Lord, what does this mean for his church? He says, Fred, the work of the church is to help people get out of their chains, break free from those ties, those soul ties. Come on. Break free from the things that's got them not, that they're tied to and knotted to. It's, it's to help unwind people. This is the work of the kingdom for us. It's not that we get a bigger church and bigger building and we get known. It's that we get down into the nitty gritty with people and we help them really work through what is going on in their life. Amen. Yes, yes, it is important. And yes, I'm going to encourage you. And yes, God's going to bless you. Come on, somebody. And yes, there's going to be a day where you step out of the thing that's been holding you. Come on, somebody. But the church's work and the work of the church is for us to get in the battlefield with people and say, listen, you got to get out of this. God wants more for you. This is not who you are. You're not, you don't have to live in that shame and that guilt. That's, this is the work of the church. You don't have to live there. And you don't have to stay there. And God has way more for you. And, and, and we're supposed to put our hands on the people and unbind them. Let them go. Loose them. And get the stuff off of them that's on them. Well, Pastor Fred, how am I going to do that when I'm bound myself? Guess what? We will buy, unbind you too. Come on. And when you unbind, we got to unbind somebody else. It, it is, the, it is a, a repetition of helping one another. This is how they did in the church of Acts. They weren't afraid. Listen, they were not afraid to deal with the stink. They weren't afraid to get their hands dirty. They weren't afraid. They got in there. Somebody said they got in there. And they unbound them. Jesus will always look at us and say, I did the work of giving them life, but you got to do the work to unbind them. I must say unbind them. So I want to end like this because I believe the Lord gave me two words for today, for us today. Two words. Are you hearing me? You ready for these words? Listen to this. The last word is this. I mean, the first word is this. Don't run from the community that assists in your healing. Don't run from the community that assists in your healing. I imagine that Lazarus was most definitely thankful that Jesus restored his life. We all must remain thankful to Jesus because without him, where would we be? Somebody say, where would I be? If it was not for the Lord, that's how you say it in the old church. If it was not for the Lord who was on my side, where would I be? I imagine he was thankful because if it wasn't for Jesus, where would he be? Still in his grave. But Jesus gave him life. 
But I also imagine that Lazarus was also thankful for the people who took time to remove his death clothes. Because you got to understand, listen, listen, they wrapped him so tight that he had to come out like this. He couldn't move his hands. He couldn't move. He could barely move. He had to shuffle. And because that people endured the stink and people endured the time and people did all this stuff, they, listen, Lazarus had to be thankful for the people who took time to take off his grave clothes. They endured stink. I'm sure they were probably all shocked trying to figure out what was going on. And the Lord said this to me. He said, Fred, tell them this. If someone takes the time to invest in you, respond in gratitude. Somebody takes the time to take off your grave clothes, respond in gratitude. If they work through the challenges with you and they go through the things with you and they spend time trying to help and love on you, respond in gratitude. We become so hateful towards the people who love us the most. And we push away the people who, need, who we need the most and the people who want to be there for us the most, we're pushing them away so quickly instead of responding gratefulness. Thank you for being there with me when I was going through this. Thank you for being there with me and helping me go through this. Thank you for not giving up on me when you should have, when you could have. Thank you for, come on somebody, we got to learn how to respond in gratefulness. Thank you for not turning your back on me. Thank you for enduring my selfishness and my childishness and my ways and this and that. Thank you when I was depressed for calling and checking on me. Thank you. Don't run from the community that's God sent to help you heal. Listen, their faith was important in his restoration as well. The community God sends to help you heal, the faith of that community is just as important in your healing as Jesus giving you life. I know this is a very teachy message, and I know, you know, like, oh, man, Pastor Fred usually be preaching, but I just felt like God wanted me to really kind of get into this thing today. I got one more for us. Y'all ready for this? So the first one is don't run from the community that's here to assist you in healing. Amen? The second one is this. This is a word for prevail. Don't run from assisting those who need healing. The Lord said this word to me. He said, Fred, your faith can create freedom. Your faith can create freedom. No, uh, it ain't, no. Listen, four crazy friends, man on a mat, ripped the roof open, let him down. Jesus heals them. Guess what Jesus does? He looks at them and says, their faith. When he saw their faith, when he saw their, listen, their faith created this man's miracle. Their faith created the freedom. Their faith, come on somebody. What am I trying to say to you? I'm saying don't run from helping those who are needing healing. If God called you there, you got to learn how to believe and trust and have faith. Come on, because your faith could create the freedom they need. Your faith could be the difference of their deliverance between their deliverance and dysfunction. People say to me all the time, I don't understand how you, could, how you can really just be patient and love people and, and be caring and this and that. Because I'm believing that one day God's going to use them. And it ain't going to bring me no glory, but they're going to really get to see how much God loves them. And how much, one day they're going to come to that revelation. Wow. 
I am loved. I am, I am God's beloved. I am unconditionally loved. I am, I am, I am. And man, how great would it be when they come to that revelation and they can look back and say, thank you to this, 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 this community that on my worst day, y'all still love me. My best day. That's fine. When I was arrogant and prideful and selfish, you still loved me. When I was low self-esteem, weak, and didn't think nothing of myself, you still thought the world of me. It wasn't just Jesus. It was the hands and feet of Jesus, the church, to show me the love of a father that I never imagined I had. Don't run, don't run from the community that's assisting your healing, and don't run from assisting in healing. This church has been called to be a sound community. Amen? And I believe God is going to do something miraculous through this house. Stay with me, I'm going to pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word today. Thank you for who you are. Thank you that you are in this place. I pray, God, that you would remain here, that you would always be with us. You will always continue to love us. God, let us have the courage to be like the people in this story. Let us have the faith to remove the grave clothes from those around us. God, let us have the faith to remove the barriers, to take away the stones so that your life, the work that, the life that you've called in those, in, in people around us, it will come forth and we can see them live their best life. Thank you for what you're doing in our hearts. Thank you for doing it in this church. In Jesus' name, amen.